Welcome into the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I'm excited to have you here for this week's conversation about what grandparents can do to help our teens feel less lonely. We've got Dr. Jean Bereson on from the Clay Center of Young Healthy Minds, or I should say the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds, and he is also a co-host on the podcast, Shrinking It Down, Mental Health Made Simple. Now, Gene and I are going to get into a conversation about the guide that he created following the Surgeon General's report on what teens are facing as far as loneliness, some of the causes, some of the effects that are going on. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation, something that grandparents are definitely want to listen to and also going to want to be sure to download this guide. And I'll be sure to put a link to that as well as the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds and the Shrinking It Down podcast into the show notes. So it'll be super easy for you to find those things download your copy, and be more prepared to help the teens in your family, the teens in your neighborhood, really feel more connected to the world around them. I also want to talk to you about Grandparents Academy. You've heard me talk a little bit about this program, and it's a fantastic organization. I love the fact that every year they put on what's called Grandparents Week, and this follows Grandparents Day in September. So, Grandparents Week is going to be a lot of experts coming on in about half hour, 45 minutes, an hour presentations all around topics that affect and impact grandparents and our relationships with our adult children as well as with our grandchildren. So you're going to want to sign up. This is a free resource, and I've got the link to that uh, Grandparents Week into the show notes as well. So be sure to check that out. The other thing I want to talk to you about is that I've started a new coaching program. And this program is really focused on new grandfathers so I can help them understand what to expect as they become grandfathers, how to prepare for that, how to set up the communication with your adult children, how to really be involved and intentional with becoming that new grandfather. We're going to talk about the tips and tricks that I've learned through all of the interviews, as well as the resources that I've consumed myself, and be able to share those in an easy-to-consume format. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you all that uh, Dr. Gene and myself, we were recording this while both of us had allergies going on. So you might hear some sniffles here and there, but the content is absolutely great. And I know you're going to enjoy this conversation because it is so important for us to understand how we can reach those teens that are feeling so alone, even though they may be up to their eyeballs in activities. So enough gabbing from me. Without further ado, let's jump into this conversation. Hi, Gene. Welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I'm excited to have you on because this is an important conversation that we're about to have. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed our last conversation, and this one is going to follow up, uh, and we're focused in on loneliness in teenagers. And I think this is something that uh, pretty much every grandparent can get behind as far as trying to be a resource, not only to our grandchildren, but to their friends and the kids out in our community, because there's so much that I think spirals out from kids being isolated and lonely and detached from their friends and the community at large. I agree. Now, what prompted this was that there was a guide that came out, I guess, about a year or two ago from the U.S. Surgeon General, and then you had a nice follow-on guide around that, about how to implement and how to work with some of the recommendations that came out from the U.S. Surgeon General. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what prompted the Surgeon General to go through and do a focus and come out with some recommendations around uh, loneliness and, and teen loneliness in particular. Well, you know, the Surgeon General is a pediatrician, and he actually wrote a book called Together, uh, a while ago and a workbook on it. So he was very uh, attuned to loneliness. And then when his advisory came out in uh, May of 2023, 
uh, he, it was really a remarkable document uh, that showed that the Gen Zs, that is uh, kids 12 to 27, are the most lonely generation in society. It, you know, it, it, it typically in the in the past was was that um, was that um, the elderly were the loneliest. But what what he determined was that um, if you look at um, the rates of loneliness among young adults, uh, they increased every year from 1976 to 2019. So that really dispels the view that a lot of people have that the loneliness epidemic was really a result of the lockdown pandemic. Um, and um, uh, 73%, he said in his advisory, of 16 to 24 year olds report significant loneliness. And that's nearly twice the rate of folks over 65. So it really is a major problem. Well, and that's that's huge because I think uh, one of the biggest factors for adult men, el older men, um, suicide is the loneliness. As we get older, it, we lose our connections, we lose our contacts, our friends, people move away, people pass on. And I know that um, mental health as far as older people is really important. And then when you think about that, as much as it affects older people, it's two times as much for for teenagers. It just that that little number there really jumped out and grabbed me. Yeah, it's 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 unexpected, uh, and and while the causes haven't been fully developed, uh, we can we can we can postulate what some of the reasons are. Uh, but loneliness is a serious problem. I mean, uh, it has emotional fallout. It has it results in sleep deprivation. It increases the risk for anxiety, depression, uh, stress, suicide, uh, and a greater risk of medical problems. I mean, heart disease, diabetes for older folks, um, a premature death, um, weakened immune system. So it's, you know, we humans... Our pack animals, <laughs> and we need each other. We need relationships, and uh, it, it seemed pretty ironic that younger folks, you know, who were in school, who were, you know, whether it's high school or college or out out there in in, in the workplace, you know, you would think that they would be well connected. Right, right. I would think that, uh, yeah, you know, and a lot of that comes from our own experiences growing up, that we had friends at school, we had friends, um, whether we were doing band or sports or academic pursuits, and then we had work friends, and then we had people we went off maybe to college with, or we went into military service with. It, it seemed like it, every step along the way, we had, um, you know, a pack. To, to run with and so i think it just it seems odd now looking back as a gen xer going well wait how these kids are having similar experiences they're not exactly the same no generation is but why is that loneliness there and uh as as we get into this i'd love for you to define what loneliness is versus being alone uh, because sometimes those can get confused, and I'd love just to have a baseline on that. Well, that's a great question. I mean, uh, my one of my favorite um, psychiatrists of all times, uh, Donald Winnicott, a, a, a British guy, um, uh, basically talked about the capacity to be alone. And he called it one of the most important emotional achievements uh, that we have. So, it, it, in other words... Um, being alone and, and, you know, we're, we're really dependent upon our parents and upon others around us as, 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 as very young children and toddlers, for example. So how do we learn to accept separation, to, um, to be by ourselves, to enjoy ourselves, to, um, uh, uh, 
not long for another person, but be able to kind of just enjoy our enjoy solitude. And, and, and he said that capacity begins when we can make secure attachments with our parents and caregivers so that we can actually feel that they're present when they're not present. So according to him and, uh, and, and this theory, um, it's being quote, alone in the presence of someone. So you always feel that you're there with somebody else. And, and, you know, everybody has what, what's not everybody, but many young kids, for example, have what they call transitional objects. That's the, the, the blanket that Linus has in peanuts um, or a teddy bear or, or something. And it, it, it provides a representation of the parent when the parent is not there. And over time, with security, with, um, with, with reconnection, with understanding, with uh, uh, reunification, uh, and, um, uh, and a whole variety of other, other uh, aspects of life, we can, we can learn to be alone. And, you know, when, and, and when people say, hey, enjoy yourself, <laughs> you know, when, I think we just shouldn't take that for granted. It's an emotional achievement because some people can't be alone. They freak out. They're desperate. And so to be able to enjoy oneself, to enjoy reading, to enjoy listening to music, to enjoy just uh, meditating, uh, whatever you're doing is an emotional achievement that's very different than being lonely which is which is feeling detached disconnected uh, uh and 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 as i said we're pack animals as pack animals being separated and apart from from others um uh brings with it all sorts of negative emotions and negative behaviors and uh and a danger so there's a very big difference between being alone and being lonely. Oh, that's a that's a great example, and I love that too because I find myself uh, when I'm traveling for business or when I'm doing some different things, I love to go explore a city by myself. If I've got the time and just I'm on my own schedule, I'm walking around, I'm I'm just checking things out, but I'm not lonely. Because I feel like at any time I can go in and sit down at the restaurant, sit down at the bar, have a conversation about sports or whatever's going on, get up and leave. Um, but then there's also times, too, in where I think walking around a city with tons of people around, you can feel so isolated at the same time, even though you're in those numbers. Right. So lo so you can be lonely in the presence of a lot of people. Uh or you can enjoy being on your own and exploring. And that's the difference between aloneness and loneliness. You know, uh, so uh, I was just in New Orleans for a meeting and, um, you know, there are lots of people out there and I, and I could see people who were really enjoying looking in the shops and, you know, meandering and going in and out. And then there were other people who seemed to need something more. Right. I always, uh, I, I can kind of figure that out with my friends on which ones are okay going to see a movie on a Thursday afternoon by themselves and which ones that would totally drive them crazy. They couldn't even envision that. That's really great. That's a great example. <laughs> now, I would like to talk a little bit about this idea um, that COVID had started this whole, let's say, I don't, I don't know this, this awareness of a lonely, of being alone and it, how true or not true that is. Uh, it's not true. I mean, because as I mentioned, uh, young people, when you, if you go back to 1976, the numbers have been increasing of loneliness. Um, <clears throat> I think, People have, have suggested a number of possibilities of why our generation of the 12 to 26-year-olds um, are so lonely. Uh, and the low-hanging fruit that many people uh, point to is social media. It's all social media's fault. You know, um, uh, but social media – and social media, yes, it has its downsides. I mean, it basically is uh, – 
it, you can make false comparisons like in the Facebook or the, I'm sorry, the Instagram scandal. Um, it can make you feel less worthy. It can make you have FOMO or fear of missing out. It can raise high drama and make you feel kind of isolated and dependent upon your, your phone. On the other hand, um, the social media has its benefits. I mean, it makes it, it helps people feel connected. I mean, if the word for if it weren't for social media and digital media during during the the two year lockdown and pandemic, I think many of our young people and adults would have gone nuts. Uh, and it was a way of connecting. And for 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 young people with social anxiety, or who were on the autistic spectrum, or who were shy, or have learning challenges. You know, uh, it can be a real benefit as a stepping stone to kind of being with people in public. But I think social media is one factor. But I think there are other factors too. Uh, and the others that occur to me is that, you know, uh, our, our young people today in the 12 to 20s are really overscheduled. I mean, you know, uh, they, they in school you have to you have to get academic high grades. You have to take honors courses. You've got to play sports. You've got to play an instrument. You've got to be at extracurricular activities. You've got to do community service. If your family needs help, you got to go get a job. You've got to take a summer internship. Uh, and and kids today, young people today, and I'm talking about from school age through college are just overbooked. They're booked, they're working 24 seven. So it, it wasn't that way when I was growing up. I mean, when I was growing up, I'd be desperate to, to, to hang out with other people on a weekend. I was bored. I'd go where I'd ride my bike and look for a pickup basketball game. You know, uh, our kids today are so overscheduled that they just don't have the time to hang out with others. And young people need time to just hang out with each other, to learn social skills, to connect, to like, even if they're watching something on television or, or listening to music or playing music together or taking a walk in the woods, they need time to, to just hang out and process and not feel burdened or pressured to uh, accomplish something. And uh, increasingly, I've seen over the years, they just don't have that opportunity. So that is a, is a real problem. Uh, uh, they, they also need time to process their experience. The reason why adolescents stay up so late at night Besides the fact that there are blue screens that keep people awake, and that is a social, that isn't a media problem. Uh, but apart from that, um, the adolescent brain is wired such that it really needs to take the time later in the day and in the evening to process what was going on, that, what's going on during the day. And that's why teenagers and young adults stay up so late and make it up on weekends, sleeping in. And it's not that they're, it's, it's just a natural biological uh, fact that, that that's what they do. And, but if they're overscheduled and they don't have time to process things, uh, it really takes a toll on them. Well, and I, I love that because it reminds me of being back in middle school, high school, and the, the pickup games up at the elementary school that was a couple of blocks away from our house. We would get home and it was kind of figure out who's going up there and who's going to play football, who's going to play pickup baseball. And then we're talking about everything and nothing. We're talking about upcoming tests. We're talking about AP stuff. We're talking about whatever's going on. And, but we had that time, but we were also doing activities. We were playing baseball. We were playing soccer. We were doing these things. And when I was going through some of the, the feedback about this topic, I, a couple of people that jumped to mind because I've heard so many athletes, I think as we were uh, younger, talk about being multi-sport and how many of these kids at 11 years old are getting funneled into one sport all year round. And 
you know, a couple of examples here in, for folks. And this, this is definitely going to skew our audience older uh, with these examples, <laughs> but that's okay because these are great examples. So Jim Thorpe, who uh, the, the famous Olympian, he played baseball, football, basketball, track and field, tennis, lacrosse, hockey, handball, boxing, and ballroom dancing, right? <laughs> and then out of that, he ends up winning a couple of gold medals for track and field and then is a professional football player. And then Jim Brown, a more recent example, he played basketball, baseball, track, lacrosse, and football. And Cal Ripken Jr. is a hero of mine since I grew up in the D.C. area. So <laughs> I'm sorry I don't have a Boston example for you. But, um, you know, he's a guy that off season he had a tennis court put in at his house so that he was playing these different things. And while that doesn't go directly to the overscheduling piece, it does go to people need to have time to find other interests. And I think the youth need that time, too, to go explore different things. What's this buddy doing? Oh, I might like working on cars because he's doing an oil change. Oh, now I've got a different interest. I totally agree. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm a musician, and, and, and I remember, uh, you know, after school, I mean, and I was an athlete. I was, you know, running uh, track and uh, did the hurdles and um I, I mean, I was very serious. I mean, I'd get up at six in the morning and I practice my starts for a couple hours. And after school, I would, you know, work my tail off. But then I then I come home and and uh, generally in the either in the evening or over the weekend, I had a friend who uh, was a drummer and I would play the piano and we would play the drums and the piano together, and we had a great time. You know, we just you know it was it was a break from what was required. And uh, I think, I think kids certainly need that. Now, what are some of the dangers for overscheduling uh, youth? And I, and I'm going to leave overscheduling is going to be up to the parents. It's going to be up to the youth, but I think you can look at your schedules and see what's on your phone calendar and see how busy they are. But what are some, some of the other things that affect kids when they do get overscheduled? Well, I think that um, they don't spend time, face-to-face -face time with other kids. And there's no better way of learning social-emotional learning, uh, which uh, a number, for the silver lining of, of COVID, frankly, was uh, parents realized that they were, that the kids were, were had fallen behind in their social-emotional uh, skills. But learning how to interact with other kids and other other people learning how to make a joke learning when to be quiet and listen learning not to interrupt learning the golden rule you know do unto others as you would have them do unto you uh, sharing uh uh all of that is missing you know when you're over scheduled you don't have time to just take a walk in the woods and notice you know, the birds, uh, and, and pay attention to things that are, that are out there. You, you don't have time to just, to, to learn, you know, how to converse with people and, and you don't have learn how to resolve conflicts. You know, I mean, we all have different opinions about things, whether it's political or whether it's about friends or whether it's about, you know, you know, the, the hardest teacher in the school, uh, um, or we have conflicts with each other. We don't learn conflict resolution. We don't learn how to have civil conversations. You know, many of our politicians don't have civil conversations, so they certainly don't learn it from watching them, uh, but they learn it from each other. Learning to accept differences in people, learning, having, having a diverse group of friends, um, uh, it's really important. And, and for, and for the other thing uh, about being overscheduled is that, you know, the Gen Z population is not just overscheduled. They're also probably more than any other generation, I think, since the 60s, which is when I was, you know, in my formative years. They're more concerned about social forces, about 
about uh, disparities among racial groups, ethnic groups, about uh, uh, mass shootings, about climate change, about economic downturn. I mean, they care about the wars around the world. They know about these things. And they care about climate change. I mean, look at the world that they're inheriting. I mean, it is really scary when you think about it and you think about all these things that uh, that contributes to loneliness. Now, if they had the time to, to be activists like I was, and I don't mean a violent activist. I mean, you know, I went. I I grew up when you know during during the war in Vietnam and during the civil rights movement and during the women's liberation movement. And I went on marches, and I demonstrated, and I expressed myself. And uh, but you know, even back then, uh, we could express ourselves in a nonviolent way and have civil conversations. You know, I'm old enough to remember William F. Buckley Jr. debating Gore Vidal. Mm-hmm. It blew me away because I really didn't agree with William F. Buckley. Okay. I didn't often agree with Gore Vidal. But they were both so bright and both so different and both demonstrated such respect. It was really t- – and, and, and Ronald Reagan with Gorbachev. I mean, you know, those days and models – and, and ways of conversing, even if you disagreed, uh, I think the I think the Gen Zs just don't see that. And having a robust conversation like that, and agreeing to disagree, and to put yourself in another person's shoes, and to understand what another where another person's coming from, maybe being convinced that they've got some really valid points. Okay, well, you know that's how we learn from each other. They don't have time for that. And and this generation in particular, I think, is very worried about the world that they're inheriting and ways of grappling with it. And I think one of the consequences of being overscheduled is that they don't have time to kind of really talk about it with each other and with, with older folks like grandparents. <laughs> right, right. Right. Well, and you also I think with the overscheduling, I think you can think that well, my child's around other kids their age. And that's true, but they're having more acquaintances than they're having deep friendships. You know, because I know I was on a lot of little league teams and football teams and things like that where there might be three or four people from my neighborhood or from my school that I had class with that I had, let's say, deep, meaningful relationships with. Everybody else was, you know, a great guy, loved to hang out with them. They're fun. But after the season was over, I never saw them again, and it didn't affect me. You know, yeah. And so I think when you get a lot of acquaintances without those deep relationships that you get from having that excess time, uh, that that leads to maybe a false sense of security from uh, parents and grandparents. Yeah, I I totally agree. You need time to build deep relationships, and you don't need that many. You know, I mean, uh, I, I still have monthly Zoom calls with like five or six of my college friends, um, and we've maintained close relationships. Uh, ever since ever since you know we graduated but um we had the time to really hang out together to uh do things together to think and to talk and you're right they're not they weren't just acquaintances I do want to pivot over a little bit and get your opinion and your insight on how grandparents can help with uh youth and even parents that might be feeling uh lonely well, grandparents are in a unique situation. I mean, uh, they, they're they the purveyors of wisdom, of experience, of family narratives. Uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, they're not as revered in our culture than they are in certain other cultures uh, in this country. But, but, uh, but in, in many, in many families, they are seen 
for their wisdom and they can they can help out a lot so for example they can take care of the kids and give the parents a break i mean young parents you know my kids who are uh millennials and and have young children uh it's a blessing for them to be taken care of by the grandparents so they can give advice to their to their adult children you know about oppositional behavior about nap time about uh about picky eating about separation anxiety about all sorts of things that they've been through uh and they can be a real support to the parents they can also be a support to the kids i mean you know they're one step away from the parents and they can have meaningful conversations with them about uh all sorts of things uh and 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 at the same time we grandparents can spoil them a little bit you know i mean we have to maintain the rules but we're also you know the ones that are going to sneak them you know you know a little you know extra treat here and there um like a second dessert uh and another thing that grandparents uh can do is tell family narratives about how we got through tough times now i remember my my uh my mother who uh lived to 102 uh went through the great depression in new york and she was uh a concert pianist and she and and, and my and my kids would always say uh, gamma tell us the story of the depression <laughs> and she would talk about playing the piano you know in in various department stores for change and uh and 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 how they got through such hard times you know uh, uh or 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 she would tell other stories about about how the house fell on the about the tree fell on the house or when the pipes broke or how we got through rough times and and so family narratives are extremely important i mean narratives in general and storytelling are so important i mean think about it bedtime stories good night moon uh you know, the velveteen rabbit uh, nightmare under my closet i mean kids love stories and narratives and grandparents really are keepers of the family narratives and kids also really value family i mean i you know family members even remote family members that they hardly know they want to hear stories about them they want to hear stories about where they grew up you know oh in los angeles where's that you know i mean so uh telling stories is really important they also have we also have as grandparents you know sharing wisdom of a long-term perspective like some things work and some things don't but we get through and they want to be reassured that whether it's um uh one thing or another we're, we're going to manage this they connect they can teach kids new 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 skills how to cook how to do crafts how to um do creative projects how to play an instrument i mean i sit down at the piano and play and and my grandchildren are sitting with me and they're they're playing too fine or well, we're singing together that's fine so you know we can teach them new skills the other thing is is that we can also validate them and make them feel good about themselves by learning from them so for example in digital media you know we are digital immigrants they are digital natives they've grown up with 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 digital media and i would i would have them teach us how to use an app how to use how to use cell phones and ipads and various things and you'd be surprised at how much young children really know about about these media uh and now we can learn on our own by going to you know like commonsensemedia.org which is a wonderful website that reviews all sorts of video games and digital media and and, and, and such but there's no substitute for having your grandchildren teach you. Uh, and the other thing is, is that we should have frequent conversations with them about their lives. So if we think they're lonely, we should ask them, 
you know, what are you lonely about? What, what does it mean to you? You know, uh, uh, how, how have you taken, how have you survived this? You know, are, are you being bullied? I mean, we can ask them the deeper questions about their own lives. And they should ask us questions. It should be mutual. You know, I grew up without cell phones. What do you mean? Well, we, we had telephones. Telephones? Like, what's a telephone? You know, or, or you know, uh, typewriters. What do you mean? You mean a keyboard? No, I mean a typewriter. I mean, and, 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 uh, and we didn't have Uber. You know, we, 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 we hardly had taxis, you know, in the suburbs where I grew up. Uh, we had to ride our bikes. So, you know, it's a mutual kind of interchange to ask questions about each other's lives. And that creates depth of relationships and, and meaningful conversations. And I think it generates curiosity, validation, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, positive self-esteem and, and the ability to kind of like ask other people what their lives are like. And w what a great way of role modeling, you know, w w you know, because that's what we want them to do with their friends and with their teachers and their mentors and other and coaches and the other caregivers. Oh, I love that. And you know, one thing that, that was jumping to mind as you were going through some of those examples is that grandparents can often add the context around some of the media that the kids are going to be seeing. Uh, for instance, the, the old classics, the when I'm saying old classics, uh, a Christmas story, right? When Ralphie gets all done up and he's in the Midwest and he's got four layers of clothes on, can't move his arms, and you're like, your grandmother lived through, the, you know, that's exactly how we did. We put bread sacks over our feet to go out and play in the snow. We did these different things. And then it it starts that conversation going about, you got to be kidding me. You didn't really do this. People didn't really live that way, did they? It's like, yeah, we did. And we survived. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, that jumps to mind that we can still add that context to some of the things that they see how important it was and i'm stuck on christmas movies for some reason but christmas vacation when he's lighting up the whole house and like yeah that used to be a thing when those lights were first coming out it was like everybody was overdoing it and then of course he's really overdoing it but a little bit of like yeah those weren't leds you had to check each and every bulb and you had to check all of that stuff and <laughs> You know, it's just one of those things that I think helps build that connection and, and helps fill in some pieces for them in their context of understanding even great books. You know, if you want to go back and talk about Hemingway and you want to talk about different things and, um, you know, you talk about the Spanish Civil War and it's like, and I'm not saying everybody's grandfather fought in the Spanish Civil War, but it's like, Hey, yeah, your grandfather was around at that time, and this was a big thing, and people were talking about it. And you know, here, here's the context from our family's point of view for that book or that piece of work. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, both my father and my wife's father uh, fought in World War II, and um, the kids would ask them, "What was it like?" I mean, they were both doing different things. I mean, my my wife's father was a triple ace. He was a pilot over Germany and we would actually you know look at some of the pictures of 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 you know of him you know flying and and my father was in the army uh in the Pacific but you know uh they're very curious about what that was like and 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 how he survived and you know you know uh they're intrigued by these kinds of of stories yeah, and they all add to that connection, right? And that's that's part of what I want to circle back to is that it all adds to them not feeling as alone when they're connected to their grandparents, when they're connected to their family story, when they're connected to, into something um, is what this helps out with. Uh, I do want to pivot over a little bit and ask you uh, 
you know, what are some of the benefits and drawbacks with social media? I know we've hit on some of those things, but I'd love to review that again before we start to wrap up. Well, I mean, there are benefits. Um, so, for example, they foster connections. I, I mean, when we had the COVID lockdown, one of the things that my family did was we created a family quarantine Spotify playlist <laughs> <laughs> where, where everybody in the family contributed a song and we pooled them together and we did this online. So we had a family connection. We FaceTimed, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 and for other kids who, like I said, it, it, who were shy or who are, who have their own troubles, they can, they can make connections uh, online. It, it's an opportunity for some to find community. I can't tell you how many young people as well as adults got into Dungeons and Dragons during lockdown. I mean, I, it, it boggles my mind that so many people got into playing games online. Um, Reaching out for help. I mean, you know, in many of these situations that we've seen, horrifying situations of mass shootings or of, of various tragedies, uh, I'll give you a great example. I'm sitting with a guy. Uh, we had a meeting, and I was telling him how I hate uh, digital media, and I hate the hate getting these texts. And the Boston Marathon – this was the day of the of the bombing, and I knew my daughter, my second daughter, was down at the finish line. And um, uh, all of a sudden, I hear my text tone, and I picked up my phone, and and it was my daughter, and she said, "Hey, Dad, I'm down here. At, I'm down here. I'm not at the finish line, but I'm 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 in this hotel a couple blocks away." Um, I forget the, uh, the Union Oyster House or something like that. And she said, there were some explosions and I don't know what to do. And I said, look, you're safe there. Do not go anywhere. Stay put. Keep me posted. And um, uh, I'm sure that this is going to be taken care of. But I don't, I really don't want you to go out on the street because we don't know if anything else is going to be exploding around the finish line she was at the finish line but after a few of the front runners came through she went over to a hotel so um i said to this guy you know i am so i take i take it all back i take it all back you know the fact that i if i hadn't gotten that text and i knew that there was bombing at the at the at at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, and I knew my daughter was there, I would have been a, a basket case until I heard from her. So um, for that, and also documenting when you see something happen, you know, I mean, the use of the cameras has been really instrumental in um, in in documenting what's what's been going on. And, and and again, it's an academic resource. It's another thing. I mean, I remember going into the library in college and having to go through the card catalogs and then go down to the stacks and sort out. We, 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 <clears throat> now, you can go on Google and you can go to Google Scholar and you can find any reference you want. I mean, it's just, it's a miracle. So those are the benefits. Now, what about drawbacks? Um well, it's a displacement of in-person engagement, and there's nothing that can substitute. Screens don't don't capture what you can get in the room. Uh, uh, fears of missing out, high drama, uh, um, uh, cyberbullying, which is very, very common. One in three people have reported cyberbullying and cyberbullying and bullying can last a lifetime with post-traumatic stress disorder, intrusion, uh, getting a tech, keeping the phone next to your bed, blue screens, keeping you up late at night because that's what they do. Uh, and you really should shut off your screens at least an hour or two hours before bedtime. Um, <clears throat> uh, trusting social media for news. I mean, 
there's so much misinformation. And as a mental health professional, I can tell you, there's a lot of very sketchy, if not bad information about mental health and psychiatric disorders, among other things. And frankly, old, young people and old people can't tell the difference between what's information and what's misinformation. And with the advent of AI coming up, uh, it's it, it, it's it's it, the dangers of that are are even worse. Uh, so um, uh, and also social media keeps our brain in overdrive. I mean, you know, I mean, people are hitched to their cell phones, you know, to their hip. I mean, and they're constantly on them. Uh, so it's it's clearly a distraction. And and speaking of distraction, distracted driving is a very serious problem among the young and the old. And so uh there are a lot of there are a lot of downsides of 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 social and digital media. Yeah, well, thank you for reviewing that. Um I think one of the things too that goes into the brains and overdrive that just some friends of mine were talking about is this idea that you might have something terrible happen in Spokane, Washington. And suddenly it's headlines and you're getting bombarded for it. And I live in Atlanta and that's ramping me up and making me feel. And it's something that happened clear across the country. It's a horrible event. It's it, you know, all of that, whatever that event might have been. But suddenly it's I'm allowing that to impact my day from the way that it's it's coming across and seeing it on the phone and seeing it on screens and and some of those things Um, that just goes into overdrive. Sorry. And and no, I I totally agree. And, and, you know, uh, so, for example, uh, we also know that that um, that you can get PTSD from digital media. So, for example, there have been lots of stories. Uh, of of uh, and re- research research studies of uh, for example during nine eleven kids seeing the towers going down and then over and over and over and over again and young children think it's continuing to happen and what they see on television uh, or on their iPads or their cell phones uh, can be highly traumatic uh, young children don't know. If they're living in Atlanta, they don't know where New York City is. They think it's right next door. You know, they don't really have the perspective of distance. Uh, so um, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's putting us all in overdrive. And then things are repeated over and over and over again. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people just don't turn it off. Yeah, because it almost becomes a thing that you have to keep feeding, and and even the teens uh, end up doing that as well as we've talked about. Yeah, um, I do want to start to wrap up the conversation by reviewing the seven recommendations uh, that came out from the Surgeon General, um, and we'll be sure to put these into the show notes as well. But I thought it would be beneficial as we wrap things up to uh, go through those those seven. So. Uh, the first is invest in your relationship with your child or loved one, and that means to develop a secure attachment uh, uh, with 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 your child. Uh, two, modify healthy social connections, uh, and that is to foster uh, their interaction and connections with others. Three is to help children and adolescents develop strong, safe, and stable relationships with supportive adults. That's where we as grandparents can come in. Four is encourage healthy social connections with peers. And, you know, a a lot of peer relationships can be very unhealthy. So we need to kind of learn from them the nature of of some of their relationships without being too intrusive. Uh, Five is be attentive to how young people spend their time online. We've talked about the pros and cons of of social media. Six is identify and aim to reduce behaviors and experiences that may increase the risk for social disconnection, which is like bullying, cyberbullying, among 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 others, uh, or or defriending, excluding kids. I mean, kids can be really mean. Um, And seven is talk to your children about social connections 
regularly. Oh, I, I love that. And to your point, you know, number three is, is the low hanging fruit, I think for, for grandparents. And even if you live a, a distance away, as you start to check in, as you can use social media uh, to, to also communicate with those kids, because you find you can get those reactions that you want from grandkids if you're where they're at. And a lot of times, uh, and it's a great way too. If you don't know how to use something, you, you ask them how do, how are you using Snapchat or how are you using Facebook, uh, Instant Messenger, or whatever it is. Ask them how, and then get connected with them, and then use it. Oh, it increases their self esteem. It increases their sense of confidence and competence. I mean, here they are teaching you, you know, their grandparent. Uh, who's so wise and who's lived through so many different things, something novel. And, you know, what? You do what next? What what button do you push? And wait, how'd you do that? How'd you get there? You know, it, it's, it, it, it helps their self-esteem and it helps them feel that they can actually contribute to your life. And, you know, I want to just emphasize one more thing for grandparents as well as the kids. And that is making a contribution. Whatever it is, whether it's sending somebody a card if they've lost a loved one, even if you don't know that person, whether it's providing a meal for somebody who's down and out or during the holidays bringing over a present to the neighbors. You know, I'm thinking of Home Alone. <laughs> yeah, we're on Christmas movies. I don't know. You know which my, yeah. my, 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 my grandson uh, loves that movie. I mean – uh, and we, we watch we watch it a lot. Uh, but making a contribution, um, it stimulates what's this neurochemical called oxytocin in the brain. And oxytocin is the neurochemical that really uh, underlies human connections. Not just human connections, but connections with others, like with animals, with pets, with with people. And uh, uh, it turns out that giving is far better and more powerful than receiving. As much as kids want their toys or their whatevers, um, making a contribution is so much more powerful and so much more rewarding that, you know, I think the moral of the story here is, is that uh, as grandparents, we can both give and receive they can give and we can all increase our oxytocin levels and feel better connected and feel better about each other and better about ourselves uh, through that process. Oh, yeah, for sure. And and it's an important thing to teach little kids, too, is is being able to uh, to give and, and showing them. Uh, I mean, one, just the act from a social interaction perspective, but then two showing it and so that they get used to that and uh, you know adopt some of those uh, behaviors and and get those benefits for it yeah yeah absolutely now gene is there anything about teen loneliness uh that i haven't asked you that we haven't touched on that that you'd like to uh bring up before we wrap things up um Well, I I think we've covered a lot. I, I think the other the other issue that we haven't talked about is to and we as grandparents can certainly help our kids do this, or you know, our millennial kids who are parents, and, and we can ask them is to ask them uh don't be afraid to ask about loneliness ask about what their life is like ask about what they're missing ask about the fallout from loneliness so if they say yeah i'm lonely and then ask about anxiety ask about depression um, ask them about what causes stress in their life and i think most importantly don't be afraid to ask about suicide and suicidal thinking uh you know, a lot of a lot of parents and grandparents are worried that if they ask about about that, they're going to 
precipitate it. But it, it turns out all the research shows it's just the opposite. There's great relief. And even, even you know, look, everybody has had some thoughts at some point in their life about throwing in the towel. And if they say no, they're not telling you the truth. I mean, we've all at one moment or another have thought about it. <clears throat> and it turns out that about 20% of young people do seriously think about it. Asking them about whether they thought about it, whether they, you know, whether it's just a thought or whether they have an intention to do something or whether they have a plan. Those are the three big issues. It won't cause them to harm themselves. It will be a relief. So ask them about some of these fallout questions about loneliness and, um, uh, and the consequences of loneliness is super important. Oh, that that's great. That reminded me too, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Is I'd love for you to uh, quickly review the three W's that you guys um, at the Clay Center have. Um... Yeah. So, so uh, what what we what we recommend for all parents and caregivers, including grandparents, is uh, understanding the three W's, and that is knowing what to look for. What are the signs and symptoms of loneliness, anxiety, depression? Uh, when to worry? Uh, it's the second W. So is this just a phase? Is this just a momentary blip on the screen? Or is this something that's persistent and that I need to worry about it? And the third one is what to do. And what to do besides having s significant and serious you know, conversations, but don't have family meetings. You know, kids will give you the eye roll. Uh, even even young adults will give you the eye roll. Um, but um, what to do is talk with them, have conversations, uh, and, and if necessary, and uh, get get an evaluation with a psychologist or a psychiatrist to see what's going on. So if we all did that as parents and caregivers of all sorts. Um, I think I think we would be able to kind of go to our pediatricians or our primary care doctors or our mental health professionals, our guidance counselors, with a much more sophisticated understanding of what's going on with the kid, rather than going in and not having that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I appreciate you sharing that with us, and and I really do appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk to us about teen loneliness. This has been a great conversation and hopefully it's going to empower some grandparents to um, start asking some other questions if maybe they haven't or uh, you know just bring awareness to what's going on with the kids and, and I might add one other yeah. thing you know uh, and that is <clears throat> many grandparents uh, not me yet are retired um, or at least have or at least have a, a schedule that's cut back um, I, you know, your grandkids are the most important to you, obviously, this family. But but grandparents can actually do a lot in the community, whether it's in your church or place of worship, whether it's at the YMCA or Boys and Girls Club or a neighborhood association, you know, uh, or on the athletic field, if you've, if you've been an athlete, you know, Get out there, get out there and mentor because grandparents can be tremendous mentors for other kids and share their wisdom and their experience. And uh, and in some ways, it's safer for kids to have a, a, a grandparent that's not their grandparent necessarily, but uh, whom they can talk with and, and get some and get some perspective. Oh, that's awesome. And that's a great reminder. I, I love talking with uh, grandpas that are also out there being scoutmasters and umpires and, oh. you know, volunteering at the hospitals and reading centers and all sorts of things. It's it's great. It's very rewarding. So Yeah, it is. Well, thank you again for being on the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I really have enjoyed this conversation with you, Gene. Well, thank you, Greg. It's been great to be here.
I really did appreciate Dr. Gene Berenson coming on and talking to me and helping me better understand what I can do to keep an eye out as well as maybe help those teens in my life that might be struggling with loneliness. It's an important topic that we have because there's so many times where we see the results of people feeling lonely, how they disengage, how they become more depressed, more anxious, how so many negative things come across from being felt like you're cut off from other people and other relationships. As Dr. Berenson said, you know, we're designed as people, as humans to be pack animals. We need each other. Now, some of those can be large packs and some of those can be pretty small, intimate packs, but either way, it's important and we're designed to really be associated with other people. And so this was a great reminder of that. It's also great having him on to give us those tips about what grandparents can do, what actions we can take, how we can be a positive role model, a positive force in those grandchildren, as well as those other teenagers' lives. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I've got links to the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds in the show notes below, as well as the Shrinking It Down Mental Health Made Simple podcast. So be sure to check those out, as well as make sure you sign up for Grandparents Academy's Grandparents Week. So until next time, remember to stay cool.